Welcome to Tim's Vinyl Confessions. I'm Tim Durling, and a uh, very, very special guest, um, Lori Larson. Hello, Lori. Uh, hey. <laughs> uh, Lori's on here today to talk about a very, very cool book. I mean, anyone who has watched my channel knows I'm an enormous Kansas fan. Um, that's hey. why, that's one of the reasons... It's one of the reasons my channel is called Tim's Vinyl Confessions. Absolutely, that's where I got it from. And we're not talking about that era, but um, Lori's got an excellent book out. Oh, Steve Walsh, um, of course, you know, original Kansas singer, sang on, you know, most of the classic Kansas albums. And this is an excellent book that Lori's put out. And um, Lori, thank you for coming on to uh, talk about this a little bit. But first of all... Um, Give the folks a little bit of background. I, you know, uh, I think we have something in common. We both have radio backgrounds. Um, oh, radio you know, a lot. Yeah, tell tell us, uh, you know, how how did you, uh, you know, get into music, and you know, maybe it'll, it'll eventually lead us to the publishing of this book. Okay, well, you know, I uh, had a weird childhood. My parents only listened to both kinds of music, country and western, so I wasn't really into music. And then I heard a radio station in Rapid City, South Dakota, KKLS, and it blew my mind because I heard Hold On, you know, <laughs> with Steve Walsh's voice. And I'm like, man, that's that's different. That's really good. I want to be part of that because music takes you somewhere. A very special feeling. It, it helps you forget about whatever might be going on in, in the rest of your life. So I decided I was going to become a disc jockey. So I made a tape. I didn't know it was an air check. I just kind of pretended that I was doing it. And uh, it ended up being so good that I got hired <laughs> immediately uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico at 94 Rocks. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm in there the first day and I'm like, I brought my own records. And they're like, you can't do that. I'm like, no, and I put on, Belexes, I guess that's how we say it, right? I've never uh, been sure, to be honest with you. Belexes, Belexes, exactly. I don't know. You know, right, exactly. But I, I really liked it because, well, I was trying to kind of match 94 Rock is a little heavier. So I wanted to play that. And the guy was, God, that's a great song. And I just love turning people on to new stuff. Uh, that was Hubby Dean. Um, and then uh, Phil Mahoney, who is now the program director that station he was the overnight guy but gosh this whole time you know he worked himself up to program director but that kind of got me started i didn't know how to run the board so therefore after they they thought i was so good they just kind of threw me in on the weekends but i didn't know how to run the remote the remotes <laughs> killed me so they were like yeah you can hang around the station but they never put me back on so in the meantime i'm, I'm like well, i want to get on a radio station anyway and I was hired by uh, Cool 102, Rob Roberts, who's still in radio, which is rare. Um, and I had a blast. I brought in my own records and I just played <laughs> whatever I wanted. You know, they were a really cheesy oldies, kind of more 50s oldies station. And here I was, I was playing like the electric prunes. You know, I was just bringing in stuff like love, you know, off forever changes and just doing stuff. And my boss really liked it, but the rest of the DJs were all, she's doing this and she can't do that and this and this. And so eventually I realized I can't keep doing this. Um, so I got hired by John Sebastian, uh, who was with Sebastian Casey and Associates. And uh, they were inventing a new format called the classic rock format. And boy, I just ate that up. I was like, oh. Finally, I found a home. They made me the music director because I'm so intense about getting details right. I mean, I can remember cart numbers from back in the day. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Cart, good old carts, which, which to, those, to, to those of you who are watching, carts were essentially eight tracks with one song on them. Right, exactly. You know, 479, you know, it's going to be <laughs> the electric prunes again. So, um, Glory, what year are we talking here? Around this when, was. Um, Gosh, you know, 1991. So, so classic rock, that that term really, that was new. That was a yeah, new term back then. Right. Sebastian had done, um, 
you know, everybody kind of copied him because he he controlled 800 rock stations coast to coast, being a consultant, um, with Sebastian Casey, and they were the premier rock guys. But here's the kidder. There was no Kansas. None. That's None a problem. Like, that's a problem for me. You want me yeah. to be the music director? We got to change that. Boy, I, I mean, I had knockdown, drag out fights, you know, just talking and just begging and trying to like shame them into doing it, trying to like analyze why they should and why it's morally, you know, <laughs> I, I did a lot of stuff to try to get them on there. And then um, finally the day came and he said, okay, I'll add it. And he's always goes through his little book, you know, well, I'll add people of the South when I'm like, no, you know, it's you mean, that, that's crazy. Stuff. It's crazy to that's me, Lori, to think that, that, it, to, that they weren't even already playing at least carry they on. Were, you know they what were I mean? so, it was like they were playing Simple Minds was on their format. You, They only had like a 200 song playlist and they're using stuff like that to take up the slots. Lots of solo Phil Collins, which I didn't agree with either. And just stuff that to me wasn't really the classic soul, rock. Classic rock, the way it should be defined. So I kept beating on them. You know, all my favorite bands were not on there. None of them. So I had to just really fight. And I finally said, look, if you can only do one Kansas song, you have to do Carry On. Yeah. People well, of the South Wind is, a, is an interesting choice. <laughs> well, it, it charted. That's why. Yeah, it charted. Yeah. but it And it was more recent than the other. So that's his thinking, you know. Yeah. And huh. I'm like, no, man, you have to do Carry On even before Dust, because to me, that would be more classic. Can you imagine having these conversations? And now it's just a duh, you know, uh, no yeah, fact. I mean, at the, the time, the, they were inventing the format and, and AOR was just like, they didn't care. AOR yeah. was not what, you know. It's it was really like, interesting because I would have thought that, you know, that the battle would have been, um, the battle would have been to play something other than carry on or dust in the wind, not, but not to, to not even like, play them at all. That's well, crazy. my, my favorite song is, is journey from uh, Mary Ron. And of course that would never happen except when I cheated and played it overnight. But yeah. Um, yeah. So basically I had to, I had to try to help, you know, come on, make this a little more guy friendly. I guess I actually have guy music taste. I guess <laughs> people have told me so. So that was quite the struggle. And then of course, um, I wanted to expand the playlist and I, I kind of was beating my head against the wall. We got him up to 400, so double, but still it's not, not where it needed it's, to be. In, to, just to you those know? of you that, that, that aren't, you know, um, that have never been in radio, 400, even 200, that might sound like a lot of songs, but it's not. You burn through those really, really quick. One day. Especially in an oldie station where you got two minutes. Now, luckily, yeah. we have Stairway, you know, and some longer yeah. ones. Well, that's how we started the station, by the way. We played Stairway over and over. We did that Dancing Fat Guy commercial. <laughs> it was so funny. And everybody copied us. So it was cool yeah. when we added Carry On. Everybody started copying us. And then they added it. Because they wouldn't add a record until John added it. Because he was the biggest consultant of the day. So... Of course, that's not good enough for me. So in the with Kansas, I got them up to six tracks, which is some kind of miracle. So there we are. Wow. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is, is that, you know, and I've been I've been I've told people this many times. Like, yeah, it's great that they have, you know, not one, but two songs that your average listener of most ages would know. But the fact of the matter is they had seven top 40 singles. They had seven charting top 40 singles. Of, well, I got a deeper cut than some of those other stuff but yeah yeah but uh so i mean me you know i was born in 74 first time i ever heard of kansas was when i saw the video to all i wanted that's when i started that's when i got on board MTV. i got into them big time about six years later and yeah. one thing that just kept coming to my mind was like why why is this band not up there with the I Zeppelin know, right and, and boston have. and you know why are they not they're, they're like at the second tier, but they should be higher. Well, what had happened in those days is they kind of got panned by those consultants that I worked with and they had this reputation. So we come in with new ears and we can hear it and go, wait a minute, this should have been here. Well, we weren't prejudiced by all the, and, and as a matter of fact, when John added Kansas, the other consultants were like, 
Why don't you add those steps? And he got ridiculed again for adding them to the playlist. Um, and I got to give him credit. You know, out of all those consultants, he actually does research. Okay, I was wrong. These other guys are tasting. Oh, no, I don't look for it, you know. But John actually and, and Steve Casey, they invented music research. And they actually care what the audience would do. So they would get an auditorium full of like 100 people. They pay them 50 bucks each to sit there for an hour for three nights and listen to clips of the song. They would write them. And that's how they would determine the playlist. And oh, I, yeah. I got to get testing. Yeah. Nobody else was yeah. doing that. Nobody else cared. So, so, you know, as much as I like to criticize, well, we added six Kansas records when you could have added 37. Um, I got to give it to them because nobody else even came close to what they did. And we always had number one ratings. So, you know, he's, he's amazing. He's actually still in Phoenix right now, uh, working at the wow factor, he calls it. And my friend, Bob, you know, who I worked with back then, he's the voiceover guy and uh, they're doing great. They're number one again. So here you are. Awesome. Does that kind of speak to the fact that, you know, Kansas sold a lot of albums, you know, they've got, you know, they've got two albums that are 4 million sold. They've got a best of that's 3 million. They've got a lot of gold records, but they were never particularly cool. Right. Does that, is that, is that got a lot to do with the resistance that you came up against? This is it. They were never cool enough, but the people bought the records. So then when we do the auditorium music test, put random people in there, they're like, Oh, I love that guy's voice. I love that guy's voice. It was Steve's voice that drove it. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Here's another story. There's a place called the Hook Factory back in the day out of Dallas. And they would do the little clips of the songs for the music test. And I heard the one for Carry On. And I'm like, did they even care? They just dropped it in the middle of the random guitar solo. What? If you only have like six seconds to listen to a record, you're going to pop in like, Steve's intro with all his layered harmonies he did. Yeah, give give him the hook. Ah, uh, give him the hook. They were called the Hook Factory. Yeah, it's like on these these bands that were were not included over and over. They just didn't care. Yeah, you know, pick so a just, random spot and. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is the next thing I did. I'm like, John, I'm gonna make the hook tape. It's like, he said, John, I'm the music director. <laughs> I'm making the hook tape. Okay. So then the hook tape, and they went from not testing very well to bam, they were number one. They actually became a power record. He has these records called P's, and they've always come right at the top of the hour, right after our ID to identify who we are, and right out of the stop sets to reward somebody. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You're you're talking terminology. I understand for sure. Okay. Um, it's um, it's really interesting that that um, you had like. You would think, and, and you know, I and I understand this. I understand this, and I and I've I've come up with I've come up, you know, not I don't want to say against it, but I have experienced it. It's not about what you might think is good. Um, there are things that are set in place oh, high yeah. above, right? Um, yeah. But when it comes to doing these samples of songs, I would think that it would benefit all if they went to someone who they knew was a fan and say, look. Yeah. Give us give us the best six exactly. seconds of these songs. What are what are the key moments? If you'd never heard it before, what would hook you in and say, I want to hear that whole thing and I want to hear it again? Exactly. You would think. Yeah. You would think. But you know See? what? They they weren't thinking back in the day. And and somebody like me was naive enough to think I could change the world. And the sad part is I changed it for a little while and then went right back to where it is. And it's actually worse now with Cheap channel. Oh, did I call him? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's worse than John's tiniest playlist ever. It's appalling. You know. Yeah, it's you know I've got I've got so many feelings on that, but you know I'm in the industry, so I'm gonna yeah. can't say anything, right? And I yeah. was afraid if I said anything, it would be like a bomb under my car or something. You know, I mean, they're just yeah. Um, you said something interesting at the beginning, and I want to I want to come back to it. You said um, when you heard "Hold On," was that the first Kansas song you ever heard? 
Yes, because it was uh, on KKLS and they were playing the hits of the day. So that was right when it came out. I and they love were- the fact that 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 I think you're the first person I've ever spoken to that the first time they heard Kansas was not one of the big two songs. Um, yeah. I think that's really I, cool. I loved it. It was just, yeah. it was really great. Yeah, Audio Visions is, is, is absolutely one of my favorite Kansas albums. So, you know, eventually, eventually, so you're obviously a big fan. Yeah. Um, I was just, I think I was just on Amazon and, and you know, Amazon learns what you typically search for. Yeah. And so I saw this, oh, was cool. a book about Steve Walsh. Like, and, I don't even think that there's a Kansas book. It's that not. I know, I know, I know. Carrie has a couple of books, but yeah, so I saw this, and I and I looked at the preview. I said, "Oh, I got to get this. This is really cool." So, um, how did how did this come about? What what led you to this idea? And and I guess specifically, why why did you concentrate just on Steve and not on the band overall? Like, you know, how did we get to this point here? Oh, right. Well, it's it's a long story. So, as a disc jockey. I had met Steve in 1996 because I became eventually the program director of the very station I was complaining about, <laughs> one of them. So so that was good. So we were sponsoring the concerts and I, I got to meet Phil uh, that day backstage and um, also Steve. But I saw that Steve was like harried. He was running away from something and I'm like, what's going on? Um, and he, then he, after, after he talked to me, he looked nervously around and he ran around again. And I'm like, what's going on? And then this crazy fan, I guess, somehow had gotten backstage and was chasing Steve. Wow. <laughs> so, and then she saw me because I'm kind of a blonde. I'm not great looking, but you know, I was enough to make her very angry. And she's looking at me like she wants to kill me. And I've never had anybody look at me with that much hatred and it stopped her just enough because apparently Steve was running to catch the bus to get away from this person and then I guess she chased them to the hotel and she drove through the front of the hotel breaking the glass to try to get to Steve and I only heard this story later after I yeah. arrived you know, when I met him, he's like, oh, God, that day I remember, oh, God. And, and here's the thing about Kansas that I want to say is that what, you know, that would make everybody really mad. But what did they care about? Steve was like, God, we were so glad she wasn't seriously hurt. Yeah, yeah. So, yep. when, you, so when you think about that, they weren't thinking about, oh, God, there's a crazy story. I mean, he was running from her, obviously. But when you think about their classy way they did that, you know, all I wanted video when at the time everything else was really salacious and they were kind of first class about that um, to how they did the documentary. They didn't want to put all this garbage in and stuff like that. They wanted to respect each other, even though they might actually be really angry with each other. (laughs) What they wanted to do was, was to, to have that spirit of goodness and, and brotherhood, which they are, they're brothers. The yeah, I, I thought that I thought that um, I I think that that all I wanted video. I remember, you know, what, what the advent of YouTube. I remember yeah. said I can't actually. I re- vaguely remember the video, so I looked it up, and I was like, yeah. you know, that 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 held up pretty well compared to some eighties um, videos. Now, I will say this: some of their earlier videos, I get a kick out of for their, <laughs> you know, like some of the monolith videos and stuff, but. Um, but yeah, and and yeah, the miracles out of nowhere. I did a review episode when that came out. I thought that was my. I thought that was really really well done, uh, and I learned a lot from it as a fan. And you know, when they recreated the picture at the end, uh, you know, from the back of the that record, was, yeah, that that was really cool. So, so eventually, so yeah, so so, so that's when you so, met Steve. I met Steve, but I was kind of like troubled, like. Because at the time, I didn't know if that crazy lady was a fan, his wife, whatever. And it kind of gave me a bad feeling, like maybe it's his, maybe it is his wife. I'm like, God, I hope not. Um, Because then I'm like, you know what? I did all this stuff for them. You know, I just sponsored the concert and I'm kind of being treated weird by this person uh, who had, I didn't know at the time, but didn't have anything to do with the fan, right? So I kind of just put it aside and I'm like, 
doing radio programming. I ended up programming stations in California, four of them in uh, Sacramento and two in uh, San Francisco, the biggest market. So I, I felt like I finally, you know, I went from, you know, make that little tape to being the overnight jock to being seven midnight jock to being the afternoon drive jock to finally being program director. I was always playing their music, but I wasn't as, you know, after that incident, you know, I wasn't so, so much, you know. Uh, but then I guess Robbie Steinhardt, you know, he came back into the band um, around 2003-ish or so. And I was like, you know, I've never seen him. Uh, let me give him one more chance. I'll go to a concert. Uh, and I went to the show and Robbie, held his hand out because I was in radio. I had like, I was right, it was a celebrity theater. I was like in the front row and like seat two. <laughs> and it's a rotating stage. And he reached out and just shook my hand for no reason. I thought, God, that guy was really cool. And then I saw Steve and he came on and he looked distraught. And so that, I don't try to get personal with him. I never got personal with, with uh, musicians when I was in radio, more business. <laughs> But it just kind of struck me to the core because here was a guy, Steve Walsh, who kind of almost saved my life back in the day. He writes songs like this. His voice elevates you. It takes you to this place. And here he is, not in that place where his music takes people. And it, it, it got to me in, in a deep way. So I thought, I got to do something. I got to do something. So I made this website and then I realized, well, I don't have content. I don't have the, <laughs> I don't have anything. And then I would ask people and they were kind of snotty about it. No, So I'm like, well, I still want to do this tribute. Maybe that'll make him feel better. So I'm like, well, I'm gonna have to learn to be a photographer. So Steve made me a photographer. <laughs> My first so you're, you're talking about SteveWalshRocks.com. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I made that website for him. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. So I made this website and then, you know, at first I, my pictures were so terrible. I was too embarrassed to put them up there. So I, I drew pictures and did art and put that up there. And, you know, that still wasn't good enough. And I thought, well, maybe I'll keep asking fans and they were really cliquish and they didn't want to help me out. So uh, as an aside, I just want to say the thing about photography that I learned is that if you go take a crappy picture of your favorite artist and then you go put it up somewhere, that's not cool, man. I mean, I don't care that you were the only one that saw this show. You're putting it, you're making your hero look less, yeah. you know, and, and, and that has always bothered me. So I'm like, I'm not going to be that way. I'm still not going to put my stuff up there. That's not good. I have to get better. So then when I got better, I started putting them up there. And then I was like, Steve, what if I make you a, a little store that goes along with the, the, the website. And uh, I mean, we still don't have content. We have a little content now. I've got a couple of pictures and and he was said, sure. So I made the little store for him, but then the little fans were all, yeah, it's not legitimate right here. Cause Steve doesn't really talk to people and I'm not talking to them a whole lot. So, so we just made this thing and uh, I made these calendars of the pictures and he, that was his favorite thing. Um, so he would buy one and I'd be like, no, don't buy it. I'm going to give it to you. Um, and then one day, you know, we only sold like two or three things cause it never caught on with the fans cause we weren't legitimate, I guess. One day, 20 calendars sold. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. I was like, Steve, 20. Oh, it was Steve who bought them. <laughs> Because he so, had taken the calendar and given it to his mother. And then I guess his whole family came and wanted one. And then he felt like he had to buy it. And I'm like, Steve, this is for you to make money. And he was just like, well, I can't do that. And he's the same way with this book. So the book grew out of this sort of, I was trying to make him mon money for him. I don't have content. What do I do? So the book uh, happened because... I basically now have over 5,000 good photographs. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not going to put the crappy ones in or anything. Um, and even editing it is kind of what you see in the book. 
So the book is just going to kind of be a photography book. And then I thought, no, yeah, I've been running this fan site. I got all these accolades. I know. It'll just be my photos with accolades. And then things changed because Steve was like talking to me about it. So then I got some more of Steve's stories. I'm like, okay. And he's like, use the ones that are on the web. So he had a, a website um, from a gentleman in Germany. He's like, go use those stories. And yes, so now, I remember I remember that one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So he's like, see if you can get a hold of this guy and try to get some of those stories. So I got some of those and he gave me a few. Um, Robbie participated. Uh, Billy Greer was so wonderful. He helped out a lot. Um, and, and, and Phil, Phil didn't want to like add anything new, but I'm like, well, Phil feels great too. Can I, you know, put stuff that you've said in the past in other interviews? Oh, of course, if you credit it. I'm like, absolutely. And Carrie was the same. So, so we got all that in there. So now I've got even more content, but here's the flaw. The fatal flaw in this book right now is I can't just put my photos because my photos are only from 2000 on. Right. Box of yeah, cans. You want some, you want some classic seven. photos. Yeah. There is no way in hell that I'm going to get Neil Preston or these iconic photographers to let me use their photos. And if they did, it'll cost. Exactly. It's going to cost me $10,000 or more. And I'm, I'm a poor, you know what radio people make. You <laughs> poor directors. We're, we're, we're doing it for the love of the music, right? Yeah, it, exactly. it's not. Yeah, it's not a money making <laughs> thing. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I hear you. So, I don't even know how this happened. It's probably Steve. Steve does things behind the scenes and then doesn't tell you and doesn't want to take credit. So all of a sudden, I'm in contact with Neil Preston and he's emailing. Me. So I asked. Yeah. And he gives me the same line. This is why I think Steve is behind it. The same line Steve always said, oh, no, I couldn't possibly take any money. He takes money for everything. You know, he sells his, you see how much he's, he charges for these, and they're worth it. Okay, so now this book has taken on a life of its own. Then Neil invites me up to Vegas to his penthouse suite. I've never even been in a penthouse suite before. And I'm like looking at all, I get to pick and choose and, and look through the photos. We did a radio show together, two radio shows together while I was up there. Um, can you believe this? How am I meeting Neil Preston? And so, so that happened. And so I'm like, this absolutely has to happen now. I mean, it's all coming together. And then I'm like, gosh, there's that one photo though. My favorite photo of Steve is by Armando Gallo. I love you, Neil. These are all great. They're all my, my second, third, fourth favorites. But how will I get in touch with Armando Gallo? Same thing. It's just kind of bam, you know, all came together. I don't know how, how that happened, you know. Um, and he was like, oh, Lori, I don't know if I, I don't even remember that session. I don't know if I have it. He looked and looked and looked and it wasn't there. So like a week before it got published, I was going to publish it. I get this call. Hey, Lori, this is Armando. Do you still need that picture? Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> so that. Are you talking about the, the one on the front cover? No. The, actually, I actually have it here. It's um, he's got his headphones on. Probably never find it here. Oh, in the studio? Yeah, he's when he was doing the sessions with um, Peter uh, uh, Steve Hackett. I think I know. I think I know what you mean. Uh, we're both no, flipping through the book. And the reason I like that one, of course, it's in chronological order, so it should be kind of easy to find. Sure, it is. It should be hard. Should should have been easy to find. Oh, it's this one right here. I mean, Steve was such a dynamic, you know, front man. I mean, you know, for those of you that's never seen, you just go on YouTube, look up old footage of Kansas. I mean, he was like practically an acrobat, right? Playing the bongos and the keyboards and, and you know, almost doing backflips and singing perfectly all at the same yeah. time. So this is the picture here. I finally found it. Yes. Okay. So that's when he was recording so, with Steve. Why yeah. I like this picture so much is that, you know, Steve's shy and he doesn't realize the great place he's taken everybody to in his music. You know, he doesn't really understand why he's getting all the attention. But this is the one moment where it looks like he might kind of realize it. 
Yeah. Job well done. Yeah. There's some. Uh, I mean, yeah. Neil Preston, Armando Gallo. Those are those are oh. iconic names in music photography. Yeah. I know. You know um, so, yeah. You know. I, I mean. I know. Sometimes you you just have to reach out. The worst someone can do say is, no. is say no or just not respond to you at all. Well, the best well, thing that can happen is that you can you can make a contact, and sometimes it's like it's unlocking a door that unlocks another door. This person knows that person, and and you never know if you if you don't reach out and try it. And you know what's really exceptional is okay. So I printed this out, and I only I was. I didn't know because I I looked at our sales, you know, from the store. I'll probably sell four copies, so I only printed like a hundred. Um, and once I printed it, all the people who didn't respond or said no, all of a sudden, oh yes. Wait a minute. Now I can get Chuck Sillery. Oh, that means I can get the iconic first album solo scheme or dreamer photos because Chuck did those. Oh, I think Glenn Wexler, who did all yep. the power. So yep. then they all came in. I mean, every iconic photographer that ever took a picture of Steve. I mean, I didn't get all of them, but I got most of them. And I'm like, yep. man, what a miracle. So I did a second edition. So those people who had the first edition, I mean, they might feel gypped, but it's definitely a collector's item because it's it's no longer in existence. And the other thing was, I made these stamps with Steve's face on them, which is against against the law now or something. But at the time, you could do that. And so when I sent those first hundred books out, I stuck those stamps on that book. So, so I, was say, do I, I must have the second edition then. Yeah, it should say second edition. Okay. Yeah. So, so everything now is this one that's a second edition because these contain Glenn's Glenn Wexler's photos. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I really like the app, the, um, you know, some of the reminiscences that, that Steve has in here, um, talking yeah. about in the spirit of things, uh, you know, the time period making that album. I mean, you know, we, you know, Kansas fans know Steve wasn't always very good to himself. So he's yeah. got, he's got a lot of awareness about that. And, uh, uh, but you know, he's, he's one of, he's one of my favorite vocalists and I don't yes. understand why he's not listed when people talk about the classic um classic rock vocalist why he's not in that conversation because to me he belongs up there with robert plant and lou graham and steve perry and and yes. paul rogers and, and david oh, yeah. coverdale i mean he's just yes. and he yes. could sing such a variety of that's one of the things i love about kansas they you know they could do prog yeah. they can do they can do sort of boogie uh -huh. They can do boogie, pop. Boogie. They they can do balladry. Right. They they could they can lean a little heavy sometimes. And yes. and he and he sings. I mean, you know, we got to give you know, got to give Robbie credit too. He was a good second vocalist, but on the classic Kansas albums and and the the yeah. the notes the notes he could hit were just astounding. And you see those that old footage from the uh, the Don Kirsten's rock concert. Yeah. He's he's hitting all those notes. It's pretty amazing. Oh, wow. So something just amazing. So his very last shows were in Germany, and um, I went out there, and I only got to go to two shows. And the the last show I was at, you know, when he goes, la, la, yeah, 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 yeah. Nobody can do that. Nobody can do that. You know, and carry on where he's screaming that. And it's really high. See, I'm sorry to just break everybody's eardrums. <laughs> we all know the part you mean. He did it more better than I've ever heard him ever, even from the 70s. I couldn't believe it. I, I honestly I have a video, so you guys should all go look at that video just in that little section. It'll give you chills. He nailed it again. How? I can't even do it. I don't know. I don't know how he yeah. does it. Um yeah, I only saw, I only got to see Kansas once, and it was in um, 1994. So it was, uh, it was right before they put the box set out because uh, Steve announced that they're they're putting out a box set. They actually did Wheels, which was kind of cool because it was, yeah. you know, a new song I'd never heard before. Right. And it, it, I mean, it was just a small. It was an old uh, forum, 
and but they played it like they were playing Madison Square Garden. They they played their hearts out, and uh, I wish that um, you know I'm in Eastern Canada, so it's not a place that Kansas comes to very often. So I usually you know I, I, I they announce the tour dates even now, and it's like yeah, that's a that's a at minimum an eight hour drive. <laughs> but uh, um, right. I'm willing to do it, but still, yeah, yeah. But um, so you you know you, you cover Steve's career with Kansas. You cover solo albums, you cover streets, and and any appearances that he has made. I mean, this is really um, yeah. complete as far as the career of Steve Walsh. Um, it, it's a and it's a really easy read, and it, and you're right, the pictures are fantastic because those '70s photos are just so. I mean, you know, God, just like the perfect guy. I mean, <laughs> exactly. That's Neil Neil stuff again. Yeah, it's great work. But you're right. I mean, like without. You know, if your photo started at, say, the year 2000, but that's nice. great, but you, you want to take people back with you. And, and I, I really I really like the fact, because I'm I'm a collector of formats, uh, you know, different formats. I'm the, you know, I wrote a, a book about eight tracks. So that just kind of right. shows you how, how deep, deep mine go. But I, I love it. the fact that, you know, even stuff like, you know, here's the old mask cassette. I know, that's my cassette. I yeah, have. I love, I love that your stuff. Your cassettes that, that, back there are awesome. I got the same. I don't have as many. I may have half as many as you do, though. Um, Yeah, it's it's really well done. There's a lot of cool, like, there's there's, con there's some concert ads here. I know. If you're, I have if like you're a Kansas a fan, you want yeah. this book, folks. You want this book, whether you get it from Amazon, whether you get it directly from SteveWalshRocks.com. This it's a it's an easy read. It's a great read. I learn stuff from it because this is not a band that there there's much literature it's out there about, and that's a shame. Uh, yeah. So so, so Lori, uh, um, if I was to ask you to name maybe your top five Kansas albums, what would they be? Oh gosh, the first album by far. I mean, I think because again, coming from corporate radio, they were unfettered. They were allowed to do anything they wanted and therefore that's why it to me outshine I mean it's just fantastic the stuff Steve was doing with the harmonies and everything and I guess I'm kind of old school so I'd, I'd probably go with the first five albums okay I, I mean, mean that first album consider how young they were it's yeah pretty, pretty they were really um I don't know how else to say they were really together very tight and the energy it's all about energy too and, and energy was there this was exciting and uh i'm kind of a hippie anyway as you can't tell by my hair so most of my music taste my next favorite band is spirit so i like okay. you know older stuff so um but you know i gotta give it i mean i heard hold on was the first one I, you know i ever heard and you know i i like loner was a great song i mean oh, I yeah. heard, like, half the songs on that i was like yeah but, um, you know, in the spirit of things, at the time, I was like, oh, this doesn't sound, you know, I was kind of a snob, <laughs> like like the older stuff. But now listening to it, it's like genius. So I, I, I see, because I'm, you know, I go back to when I first heard them, it was all I wanted. So years later, when I get into that, Power is one of my favorite albums by then. Yeah. And I, I think. I understand that old school fans might say, well, that's their, that's pop. That's not their, boy, I don't know. Silhouettes in disguise. That's not really poppy. Well, that's and, and, you know, power. It's power. Yeah. But I was, my, my whole thought was, and I've said this before that as far as a seventies band making that transition into the eighties, I think that power should have been Kansas equivalent to what yes did with 90125. That should have been a huge yeah, album. Top. It should have been a top four. I mean, it was actually in, in some, I think in Canada, actually, it was top 10, all I wanted. It was top 10 on AOL. It did all right, yeah. It, I mean, it, it did okay. It just should have done better. And I think that yeah, they could have gone three or four singles deep with that album. It could have just yeah. been a big, but, you know. And, and, and one of the things that I love about getting back into the, you know, in early 92, like 92, that's really when I kind of went on a renaissance with classic rock bands because yeah. I'm a child of the 80s. So I yeah. got really into Queen. I got into Deep Purple. I got into Led Zeppelin. And Kansas were right there along with them. And one of the things that drew me in was the album art. You oh. see the album covers for Left Overture, Pointed Overture, and and even Monolith. Yeah. I just thought they were the coolest America. thing. Yeah, song for love. It's one of my favorite logos. 
Um, yeah. and, and I love the fact that they put Monolith out in 79, this dark, moody album. They presented it to the label and the label said, we'll put it out. I love it. Thank you. I just love the fact that they were able to get away with that. Yay, Don Kirshner. Yeah. Oh, Don Kirshner brought, you know, to me, like people can talk about anything else that he did as far as music was concerned. When I hear the name Don Kirshner, I think of Kansas. Yeah. You know, that's what he did. Don um, Kirshner rock concert. Got to be Kansas all the way. Yeah. Got other yeah. great bands played, but yeah. So well, now I just want to put on all these albums. So, Lori, thank you for putting this book out. As a Kansas okay. fan, it just it was just something that, you know, when all of a sudden it's like, this is a book that I, I've i been wanting to have something like this. Oh, so um, good. at this point, this is where you get the floor. What are you what are you working on now? Where can people find you? And yeah, this is this is where you, you know, give us give oh. us your best feel. What what are you up to now? You know, I'm going to do a revamp of this website for Steve. Uh, I'm going to do something called the Songs of Steve, where I had this before, but through various changes, it sort of got ripped apart. So um, I'm going to have the lyrics, everything on there. Just, just you know, kind of how the book is, but put that on the website too, some of that. Um, I just finished another book. It's about a different kind of star, not a rock star, celestial star. So I did a book about the constellations that you can see from the northern hemisphere and that's being printed right now um and i have an album out that is up for a grammy as is uh robbie steinhardt's solo album it's also up for a grammy we're both wow. on, on the uh best rock album and i'm up for best rock song with um just above the flood so if you're bored you can go google my name and just above the flood let me know if you like the song Wow. Okay. Um, wow. I didn't know that. I got to check that out. So Steve Walsh, the book is called When They Call Your When They Call Out Your Name. Uh, hard to miss. Covers really distinctive. Hey, Go yeah. find it. If you're if you're a Kansas fan, you need this book. If you're not a Kansas fan, shame on you. You need to get into shame Kansas. Shame on you. Shame on you. <laughs> Lori, thank you. Thank you so much for 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 uh, talking with me here. This is um, it's been a great conversation. It's great to talk radio with people, and it's it's great yeah. to talk Kansas with people because I'm a huge, huge fan. Like you, who knows what radio really is and what we've gone through. That's yeah. I never get to talk to people about radio, so thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right. So remember, SteveWalshRocks.com. That's uh, you know the the site that uh, Lori's been talking about. Lori Larson has been my guest, and uh, thanks everybody for watching this edition of Tim's Vinyl Confessions.